Oh, hey, cat. Hi, guys. Dane here. I'm Biggie, apparently. And today, we're going to get started on my December reading wrap-up. So, I have several books to talk to you about. I'm going to start here with Le Chien de Baskerville. And this is The Hound of the Baskervilles in French. Basically, been reading this because I've been learning French. It was very useful, actually. I've done a separate video on some of the phrases that I picked up from it. And um, I've also written a full review of it in French. It took me ages. It took me like six to eight weeks, I think, to read this thing. And actually, now I've downloaded an audiobook of it that I might listen to as well. But well, that's eight and a half hours long. And it's harder to listen in French than it is to read in French. But still, I feel very accomplished for having read this. Uh, I gave it a four out of five. I mean, I've read Down of the Baskervilles in English before, so it was kind of a reread for me. Enjoyed the story, but I also enjoyed the added experience of reading it in French as well, and it being the first French novel that I have read. So next up, I have Trois Nouvelles by uh, Edgar Allan Poe, but I don't think that'll be in this wrap-up. I don't know. Maybe it will. We'll see. Okay, and then on top of that, I've been reading some of these short Ladybird books as well, so I treated myself... Well, actually, sorry, I asked my mum for the box set of these for Christmas because she asked me if there was anything I particularly wanted and this is like the last box set that I want or that I know of that I want so uh, I'm going to read a, a, a review a bunch of these super quickly for you so these were all pretty short reads about 40-50 pages long they're all written by Vera Southgate in the 1960s and obviously most of them are adaptations of say the Brothers Grimm and stuff so here we have Cinderella and my main thing with this one was that I wondered what would have happened if Cinderella had been in the pumpkin when it transformed back, I guess. Pretty good little interpretation of it, though. I gave it, like, a, probably a 3.75, maybe even a 4 out of 5. I don't know. Cinderella's one of those classic stories, you know. Maybe the gender norms in it are a bit weird these days, but, you know, it is, it is what it is. Then we have Hansel and Gretel. This one was strange because it almost read, like, two different stories. Because we have the first story of the... Their parent, well, their stepmom is like trying to get rid of them. She tries to lose them in the woods, and so they have like following the trails of breadcrumbs and stuff. And then there's the other story where they like meet the old witch inside her gingerbread house, and they kind of feel like two very different stories. But you know, hey ho, it's a, again a classic story. Probably a four out of five for this execution. Actually, actually, I did quite enjoy it. Then we have Goldilocks and the Three Bears. What I would say with this one is this one felt as though there was a lot missing from the ending. Like some of the versions I've read of this, a lot of stuff happened. But basically like the three bears come back and they they come into the house and they find her asleep. And then she just wakes up and she's like, sorry, I'll go now. And and she just leaves and it's just a bit a bit of an anticlimax, I suppose. But yeah, probably like a 3.5 out of 5 for this one. Again, another classic children's fairy tale. And then here we have Dick Whittington. So this, I didn't realise that Dick Whittington is an actual historical figure. There was a mayor of London called Dick Whittington. However, the rest of the story is totally bogus, you know. Well, it's a, you know, it's a fairy tale. It's not really meant to be true. But yeah, I thought that little bit of trivia was interesting. So one of the things I will say about these editions, at the end they all have, like, not, I wouldn't say essays, but they have this short history of the story. And so that's where it says here, um, you know, it's so loosely based on Richard Whittington, a rich merchant who served three terms as mayor of London. Uh, he didn't have a successful rat catching cat and all this stuff, but yeah, it was all right. 3.5 out of 5. It's not one of the stories I'm particularly interested in, but you know, it's part of the collection and I'm glad to be, you know, getting to know some fairy tales a little bit better. Okay, I've got three more books to talk to you about. So first up we have Patty Smith, Just Kids. So this is basically her memoir of her and Robert Mapplethorpe. Uh, they were both kind of artists and poets and lovers and friends and confidants and all this stuff. And basically this covers mostly the late 60s and early 70s. And she meets everyone. Like she met Allen Ginsberg and Salvador Dali and all these people. Uh, Janis Joplin, Jimi Hendrix, etc. All in New York, you know. And it really is a fascinating memoir and a glimpse of its times. It doesn't do a particularly great job of talking about like Patti Smith's later work or like what I actually know her for with her music and stuff. Because obviously covering the late 60s and early 70s, it was more of the formative years. But it is this really touching kind of, yeah, like love mem. It's like a romantic memoir, but also an artistic memoir with also cultural and his historical value as well. Very well written too. I am definitely glad I read it. I gave it a four out of five. And then I have two more of the Vera Southgate books for you. So we have Jack and the Beanstalk. So the funny thing about this one is like the, the fairy character in it. She basically... 
deliberately ends up making sure that Jack has got these seeds so that he'll go up and meet the giant and basically kill the giants. It's a very manipulative fairy. But yeah, it was alright. It probably wasn't the best t telling of this, but 3.5, 3.75 out of 5, it, it was I. Uh, I think Jack and the Beanstalk actually is one of those fairy tales where it does really merit being explored in a longer length because you can just get a lot more to happen I guess. And then we have Little Red Riding Hood and this definitely wasn't one of the best versions of Little Red Riding Hood I've, I've read. Basically the problem with some of these is to make them fit the right length. Some fairy tales are kind of stretched out and others are cut down a bit too much and this one again felt like it was cut down a bit too much. But you do still have that core story of Little Red Riding Hood going out into the uh, into the forest and going into the cottage where the wolf was eating her grandmother and all of that stuff. So it was alright. I mean, I don't think any of these are going to be, be below a 3.5 out of 5, and that's what I'm giving for this one. But uh, it certainly wasn't mind-blowing. Not my favourite of these so far. And again, I'll be doing a wrap-up at the end where I rank all of these from my favourite to least favourite. Alright, i got a couple more books to update you on here. So here we have Puss in Boots by Vera Southgate. Again, another one of these little ladybird tales for children. And, um, yeah, this one was interesting enough, I guess. I mean, it even said, actually, in the... in the They have these little history of the tales in the back, which are arguably more interesting to me than the tales. But um, it was talking about, you know, Puss in Boots and popular culture and how it's a character in Shrek. So that was kind of cool to, you know, read about that, I guess. Especially when presented with this version of it written in like the 1960s the only thing i did think is like the cat eats this ogre who can change shape so that he tricks the ogre into turning into a mouse and then swallows him and i'm like couldn't he change back into an ogre and just explode the cat but no that doesn't happen all in all yeah it was all right 3.5 out of 5 it is what it is you know and then i read divided why we're living in an age of walls by tim marshall so i'll be doing a full review of this as well this is a non-fiction book about walls essentially and how different walls have kind of shaped our perception of the world around us I guess and yeah I've already talked a little bit about this to Noemi as well it's because it's quite recent it's 2018 so um, yeah I need to talk about like Trump's border wall stuff in China like comparing the Great Wall of China to the Great Firewall so yeah the sections we have we have eight of them here and I'm currently in Africa so we have China USA Israel and Palestine the Middle East the Indian subcontinent Africa Europe the UK so, yeah, would recommend if you want to know a little bit more about walls and the role they play in kind of our society and in global politics. They're definitely a fascinating book. And, uh, yeah, he took like a really complex subject, I guess, of global politics and just focused on this one area. And in doing so, he made something, I would say, you know, pretty, pretty readable, pretty easy to digest. And, you know, a lot of skill is required to do that. Hello, Dane and Floppy Cat here. He's guarding the sign. And today, we're going to look at a few more books that I've finished. I've actually just talked about these for my vlogs, so I don't know how much I have to add. But we'll start with these three Ladybird Tales. So I've read a few more. I read Rapunzel. Now, my main thing with Rapunzel was it's a bit odd because she can literally sustain an entire person's body weight from her hair. And I would imagine that would not only rip your hair out, but be very painful. Possibly pull her from that window she's sitting in. Uh, she also doesn't recognise the difference between the witch's voice... And the prince's voice. And it's like, pretty sure they would sound fairly different, you know? Um, I don't know, maybe the prince is a really good impressionist. Overall, though, it's alright. It's like probably a 3.5 out of 5. It's not the best fairy tale. Then we have the princess and the frog. And I don't think I've come across this one before. So that made it quite a, you know, a refreshing thing to read. Basically, this princess has got this golden ball that she really loves. And she drops it into a pond. And this frog's like, oh, I can jump in and bring it back out for you if you want. Um, but you have to promise me some things. You have to promise me that, you know, you'll uh, you'll let me follow you and you'll let me sleep on your other pillow on your bed and you'll share from the same plate as me. And she just runs off and is like, nah, I'll just leave him once he's got my ball. Uh, but the frog follows her home. And then, to be fair, the old king in this, her dad, is like, no, you promised the frog, mate. You've got to live up to the promise. So she does that. And then obviously the prog, t the, the prog, the frog turns out to be a prince and he transforms back into a prince while they're in bed together as well, and I'm like, that's a bit... Oh, I don't know, a bit creepy. I don't know if I'd want a strange man transforming back into a fully... You know what I mean? Just when you're lying there in bed. But yeah, it was, it was alright. Probably 3.75 out of 5. Then we have Rumpelstiltskin. So this is about this little dwarf who gets his beard caught in a uh, spinner loomy thing. No, he doesn't really. He just looks like it. He's getting very close to it. Basically, this guy tells the king his daughter can t uh, weave straw into gold... 
And the king locks her up in this room with loads of straw and, and is like, okay, turn this into gold, otherwise tomorrow I'm going to kill you. And she starts crying because she's like, I, I can't. And then this little, like, I don't know, this leprechaun shows up and he's like, I can do it if you give me your ring. So she gives him her ring. And then later, I think he asks for, like, I don't know, a tiara or whatever, you know. And then on the third night, he's like, oh, I can't actually remember what he says on the third night. doesn't he? Oh, no, he says he's gonna, she's going to have to marry him or something, unless she can guess his name. So she sends her spies out to try and find out. And eventually she figures out his, his name's Rumpelstiltskin. And he's like, oh, I got, I got busted. 3.5 out of 5. It's like, right. okay. Then we have Persuasion by Jane Austen. So this is probably my least favorite book of the year. But I'm kind of not surprised, like, I know Austin isn't the most approachable of writers, you know, but I do read quite a lot of classics. Um, but yeah, she's just really not for me, so I've already read some of her juvenilia, some short stories she wrote when she was a teenager. And to be fair, they were intended just for her family, they weren't intended for publication, and they ended up being in the Penguin Little Black Classics box set. Um, so I, anyway, I read them, and the spelling was atrocious, and the storytelling was dire. And then in this one, the spelling's a little bit better, the storytelling isn't any better. It's just, the only reason I can see why you would be interested in reading this is if you're interested in, like, societal roles of the 1900s, you know? Which I'm not. I don't even understand societal roles of today. And don't really give a shit. <laughs> so, so, it was kind of difficult to engage with the subject matter, I guess. And also, I mean, is it a romance? I don't really remember, because this is the thing. I got, like, 60 pages in, and I just sort of bailed mentally. But I still forced myself to finish reading it just so that I could say I've read a Jane Austen novel. But yeah, one out of five, unfortunately. But again, just for me, and I totally appreciate she's a lot of people's favourite writers. For me, she reminded me of Dickens in that she was like crazy wordy. Except Dickens, I feel like he has more plot. And also I'm more interested into the kind of the social things that he raises. Like in a Dickens novel, you'll read about someone starving to death because they don't have a job, you know? Whereas in this, you'll read about some young woman worried that her sugar daddy isn't going to marry her anymore and pay for her the rest of her life because she said something wrong. And I'm like, ugh. Yeah. Uh, it's a nice addition, though. I'll, I'll be selling it. I'm no longer going to be keeping all of the books that I read because I have too many. So that'll be one that I'll sell. And then we have Divided, Why We're Living in an Age of Walls by Tim Marshall. So this is a non-fiction book and it's about walls and like border walls. So it starts in China when we've got the Great Wall of China and uh, the Great Firewall of China. Then we move on to America and Trump's proposed border wall. We have things like the Middle East, uh, Israel and Palestine. The UK's got its own section because after Brexit it's unclear about what's going to happen with the Northern Irish and Republic of Ireland border. Uh, yeah, I mean... One of the first, it could be potentially one of the first land borders in British recent British history. Like I know we had like the Hadrian's Wall, which we talked about in here. Um, but yeah, it was a really interesting book. I've seen a lot of criticism online that said he didn't go deep enough, but I actually think he just went just deep enough to cover all these different regions and to take something as complicated as global politics and to make it actually quite approachable. So I was impressed. Uh, I gave this a four out of five, and uh, yeah, and he's written a book called Prisoners of Geography, which I might read at some point as well. All right, you're ready for some more fairy tales. Uh, here I have The Three Billy Goats Gruff, again, all by Vera Southgate. And uh, this one was relatable because of the troll under the bridge, and he just doesn't want to be disturbed. And I get that. I don't like being disturbed either. And, uh, yeah, I mean, it's a classic fairy tale for a reason. I'll probably give it, like, a 3.5 out of 5, though. I mean, it's not the most amazing of the box set. I'm actually going to be doing a full wrap-up of the entire box set as well, so check below for the link to that if it's out. But, yeah, it was all right. Then we have The Big Pancake, so this one I don't even remember, but I remember it slightly. It's about a big pancake that starts rolling down a hill and everyone starts chasing it. It's what uh, they call like a cyclical story, so just new elements keep on getting added, and so like more and more people join in the chase. But for me that makes it kind of boring, because nothing really seems to happen in it. But uh, yeah, it, again, it was okay. I'll probably give it like, this one's like a 3 out of 5, but mainly because for me it doesn't have those associations with my childhood or anything, you know? Okay, then we have The Enormous Turnip, and um, this one's also a cyclical story. It's basically about this man who's got this massive turnip, and he tries to pull it up, and then he gets his wife to help, and she tries to pull it up, and then like the cat and the dog and a mouse, etc. all come in. It was a little bit better than some of the other ones, though. I'll probably give this one like a 3.5 out of 5. Yeah, it was... Uh, 
It, it was what it was, you know. Uh, it reminded me actually of Roald Dahl and James and the Giant Peach, so I wonder whether Dahl had read this and got some inspiration there. But I personally had not come across this one before, and yeah, it was just alright. Then we have the Princess and the Pea, and with this one I'm not really sure what the point of it was. Like, the, the Princess could feel the pea through the mattress because princesses are s super sensitive, I guess. But yeah, like, a princess shows up at this house and the old queen wants her to maybe marry her son, the prince. Which is like, I must make sure she's a real princess. So she puts a pea under her mattress and then puts like mattresses on top of mattresses. And, and is like, yeah, this will weed out a fake princess. It's all a bit weird, really. So it's like a, it's still a 3.5 out of 5, I guess. But no, never been one that I've particularly, been particularly keen on. Alright, we've got some more of these fairy tales here. So here we have Snow White and the Seven Dwarves. This is a fairly well known one, I guess. Uh, this was a pretty interesting take on it, I suppose. I actually liked in this that at the end she gets uh, poisoned by the apple that makes her sleep. And instead of having to have some, like, prince or whatever bring her back to life, uh, she's in a carriage inside her coffin and then the carriage goes over a bump and that jolts the apple out of her mouth. And so, no consent issues, hooray! <laughs> All in all, pretty good version of it. Kind of a darker version than I remember, but uh, yeah, 3.75 out of 5. Alright, up next we've got The Gingerbread Man. These are all again by Vera Southgate. Uh, this one is about a gingerbread man who, uh, he gets brought to life because his parents want a child. So they make a child out of gingerbread for whatever reason. And then he basically has to run away because everyone's trying to eat him. And it's another one of these like cyclical tales where more and more people join in the chase. And eventually he finds this fox, and this fox agrees to take him across a river, and he sits on the fox's, like, rear. And then the fox is like, oh no, you might get wet, you'll have to come up to the front. Come and set my snout where you won't get wet. So he does, and then, you know, this happens. All in all, yeah, probably 3.5 out of 5, it was okay. I don't really like these cyclical tales or cyclical tales in general, so, you know. Then we have the little red hen. Honestly, don't remember what this one is about. I described it in my review as the blandest one of the lot. So literally, about five minutes after I finished reading it, I was like, what was that about again? It was about a hen. That's about all I've got for you. So yeah, two out of five. Sorry. And finally, I decided to just go through and finish reading all these because they're pretty short. So uh, the, magic po the magic porridge pot. And this is about a porridge pot that kind of overflows and just makes infinite food, basically. And uh, yeah, we follow... What happens with that? Again, it's another pretty bland one. As bland as unseasoned porridge. So, uh, 3 out of 5 for this one. It's also one that I hadn't heard before. The same with The Little Red Hen. So maybe that's why I didn't enjoy them much. Because really, I was kind of picking these up just to get back in touch with some of my, uh, you know, some of my childhood. Okay, so with those out of the way, we can start to talk about these. So, uh, next up we have A Skin Full of Shadows by Francis Hardinge. So this, I guess you could call like magical realism, historical fiction with a bit of YA thrown in. I've read The Lie Tree previously and enjoyed that. And I picked this one up because Anthony Andrews, who has a booktube channel, he messaged me out of the blue and asked if I wanted to do a buddy read. And he gave me a list of a few books and one of them was this one. And I'd read uh, Hardinge in the past and enjoyed, enjoyed it. So pick this one up. This one is set sort of during the English Civil War, really. And um, there's this family that's kind of got this secret where they can kind of... When they die, they can turn into ghosts and uh, get absorbed into, like, a host body. So we follow this young girl who also has this power, and basically she realises she's just being kept by this family to um, to be a vessel, basically, for one of the ghosts. So she decides to run away. Uh, but what I thought was particularly interesting in this, there was a scene when she was having a bath, and uh, she mistrusts baths because, you know, in her sort of superstition or whatever baths like the water gets into the pores and it can make you ill so she doesn't want to have one and also they're only bathing her and like checking her over for lice and all this stuff because they want to use her body so it's pretty sinister you know all in all i as i say I enjoy this more than the lie tree i gave this probably a four maybe 4.25 out of five glad our buddy read it thank you anthony then we have another buddy read which was day by eli weisel so basically Weisel wrote Night, which is his non-fiction account of the Holocaust, and then there's Dawn and Day, which follow up in that series. I reviewed Dawn not long ago. Uh, Dawn and Day are both fiction, so it's a bit weird. It goes non-fiction, fiction, fiction. Uh, Dawn I did quite like, though, because I like the general storyline in that one, whereas in Day, I didn't particularly care for the storyline too much, nor the characters, really. There was some really, you know, beautiful writing in it, which is impressive because it's translated from French as well. Um, 
but uh, there was also some great philosophy, but the actual story itself wasn't so engaging. So I gave this a 3.25 out of 5. Okay, and that brings us on to Snowpiercer Volume 2, The Explorers by Legrand and Rochette. And so it's my understanding that another guy did Volume 1 and then he died and then these picked it up for Volume 2. And I think there's also a Volume 3. Uh, it's basically a graphic novel about this train that's like a post-apocalyptic train traveling through the wilderness and the different carriages in the train kind of represent different classes. Uh, it's a bit like a train version of High Rise by J.G. Ballard actually. Um, and yeah, it's really good. I mean, my, my other half has watched the movie and thought there's some really interesting stuff to talk about in the movie. I've read the first of the graphic novels and so after we talked about it I decided to get the second one as well so that I could lend it to her and we could talk about it, you know? So. Yeah, um, really enjoyed reading this one, and I probably will be picking up Volume 3 as well. I'd probably gave this. I would say this is a 4.25 out of 5 as well. Okay, I have two more books to wrap you up on. So I'm going to start with this one, which is Alien 3 by Alan Dean Foster. This is like the official novelization of the movie. This time it's hiding in the most terrifying place of all, uh, which is basically a penal colony full of men, and Ripley's the only woman. And they've all found religion, but will it last? And uh, yeah, I mean, it ties in very closely with the movie. From what I remember, it's the movie I know the least of. Bye then, Biggie. Boo, 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 boo. Oh, he's gonna sit here. He's gonna he's gonna get some fuss. So it's the my least fa like least favorite of the movies, but it's a pretty decent interpretation of it, you know. Uh, overall, I gave this like a three point five out of five. It was the weakest of the Alien books, but it was all right. And uh, I will be doing a full review of this soon, so watch out for that. And then here we have Boule de Feu by Anouk Ricard and Etienne Chez, and this is, oh god, how do you explain this? Well, it's a French BD, which is like a graphic novel, and it's very, like, fantasy and surreal, almost like Alice in Wonderland-esque, I guess. Like, you have, look at this, look how trippy this is. Um, but it's got a really awesome storyline as well, so they're looking for, like, Sage Patrice and the Boule de Feu to, which is a ball of fire to, like, so they think this guy is Sage Patrice. He, he ends up, like, not doing so well, like there he is in his underwear, and then he gets a stick up his ass, like literally. Uh, yeah, I'm probably going to do a full review of this as well, because it's just a really beautiful, really beautiful book, and um, it kind of means a lot to me as well, because I read it all with, oh, don't show that, that could be demonetised, there's a, like, woman with six breasts. Uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, really beautiful, and uh, yeah, I read it with my girlfriend, and she's French, and I'm learning French, so we read it together and I like read it aloud and tried to interpret it and then she told me whether I was doing a good or a bad job. So um, yeah, as I say, I'll probably do a full review on this because I think it's a really interesting one to talk about as well. Uh, so yeah, boule de foot. All right, just got the one book to update you on today and that is The Exploits of Brigadier Gerard. This is by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle and this is kind of historical fiction. Apparently you started writing this after he finished writing Sherlock Holmes. I guess basically he needed a new series to get started on and this is basically a guy who was in Napoleon's army and it's like historical fiction even written then you know based a hundred years or so earlier or whatever and um, yeah he's not a very likeable character but I'm not sure as well how much of that is actually based on the real figure of uh, Brigadier Gerard but um, yeah, I really enjoyed it. I gave it like 3.75 out of 5. Um, some of the writing, well it's because it's just old school you know. Um, but it never hampered my enjoyment of it really. I think the subject matter in itself isn't something I was particularly interested in. However, because I'm learning French, my girlfriend's French, so I've been trying to, um, you know, learn a bit more about French history and culture, I guess. So this was one way to do it. And yeah, it was pretty good. I would recommend uh, checking it out if you're into historical fiction and or you like the Sherlock Holmes books, I guess. I mean, I would say after reading Holmes, probably your next stop should be The Lost World. Um, but yeah, I mean, I've read a few extra uh, Conan Doyleys, so I'm trying to trying to slowly work my way through his whole back catalogue, you know? Okay guys, so I've got another book to talk to you about today, and that is Minority Report by Philip K. Dick. It was pretty good, I gave it a 4 out of 5. It is kind of misleading though, because the blurb is the movie cover, it's just called Minority Report. Uh, the blurb only talks about Minority Report, and it turns out to have a bunch of different stories in. So it's got Minority Report, Imposter, Second Variety, War Game, What the Dead Men Say, Old to Be a Blobal, The Electric Ant, Faith of Our Fathers, and We Can Remember It For You Wholesale, which is what Total Recall is based upon. Now, the problem with this is, like, Dick, you can tell that he's trying to set up uh, twists at the end of each of the stories, and so you kind of see them coming and start to predict them. And that happened quite a lot. And also with like both Minority Report and We Can Remember It For You Wholesale, it's kind of weird because they got full movies out of them, but actually the short stories are pretty sh 
pretty short, you know, by their nature. I think the longest in here is actually second variety. So uh, I'll give you a few of my highlights. So Minority Report, obviously pretty good, just too short. Second variety is about like a war going on between the Russians and the Americans. And uh, the Russians have created these military robots, basically. And they know what robots one and three look like. Uh, so one looks like an injured child. One looks like an injured soldier. One looks like a little lost child. Um, and so yeah, we're trying to find out what model number three is, and then the twist. There is a model number four. Very obvious. Um, yeah, what else we got? Uh, War game that was about uh, basically this like, alien company creating games for Earth children, and this company has to test them all. And uh, this one is like these soldiers attack this castle. But every now and then the castle absorbs one of the soldiers and they don't know what's going to happen when there are no soldiers left. So they're a bit worried about that. What the Dead Men Say, that's kind of more about politics really. Um, and it follows, basically in this society death has kind of been cured. So you have your half-life which is when you die and then you get brought back to life. And this one guy can't get brought back to life. But it seems as though his voice is being like beamed out across uh, space and stuff. Um, oh, to be a global, that's basically about a war between... There's lots of war in this. A war between uh, Earth and this alien race. And so these people kind of gain the ability to transfer into a blobble, which is like a blob, basically. And, uh, yeah, but then after the war, they kind of involuntarily still keep on turning over. And it's like, looks at society's reactions to that. It was all right. And um, the electric ant was pretty good, actually, because that was about a guy who discovers he's a robot and discovers he can change his own reality. So all in all, yeah, pretty good read, uh, good for sci-fi fans, 4 out of 5. Alright, i got one more book to update you on, it is My Purple Scented Novel by Ian McEwan. I've read Amsterdam before and I didn't like it much because I didn't agree with what McEwan seemed to be trying to say about assisted suicide. He was basically arguing against it, whereas I support it, I guess. I mean, it was written in like 1997, but he implied that you could easily trick somebody into being euthanized you know which is not true there are so many checks it's unbelievable and you know that's a good thing so i kind of went into this not expecting too much and it didn't deliver too much as well it was just a pretty cliched story about two horrible white men and one of them steals the other one's book and that was kind of the point of it and i'm like well you know if it was one of your books ian i'd let you keep it so i gave it a two out of five and i just yeah i don't think i'll be reading any ian McEwan again I've read two now and both of them were just, they're like very cliche, but also like ill-conceived and badly thought out, or at least that's my feeling towards them. So yeah, bit disappointed with this one. All right, I have three more books to talk to you about. So the first one here is Deep Thinking by Gary Kasparov, where artificial intelligence ends and human creativity begins. So this is non-fiction. Gary Kasparov uh, used to be the former chess champion of the world. He's famous for losing to IBM's Deep Blue computer in 1997, which was the first time a chess uh, computer program had, uh, you know, defeated the human grandmaster. More recently, we've had the same thing happen with Go as well, which, again, like people said it would never happen with chess, and they said it would never happen with Go. And it just happened, you know. Uh, this was probably more about chess than I was expecting, to be honest, considering it's hyped up as like a book about AI. And it does touch upon AI and covers AI topics, but not as much as I was expecting, you know. So uh, it does have some great stuff in there still about machine learning and uh, natural language processing. It talks about um, the rise of like autonomous elevators where, you know, where we just used to them now where you go in and you push a button, but they used to be manual operators. And actually the technology to switch to automated ones was available super early, but people were just afraid to get into something controlled by a machine. And he kind of says that's similar to self-driving cars today, which I, I agree with. All in all, I gave it a 3.5 out of five, but I would say you probably shouldn't read this unless you're either really interested in chess or really interested in, in AI. And you're only going to love it if you're really interested in both, you know? But full review of this, either out now or coming soon, so I'll link below if I can. Then we have some of my bedtime reads. So here we have Trois Nouvelles by Edgar Allan Poe. So this contains Le Chou de la Maison Usher, Le Chat Noir, and La Barrique de Montalado. And this is three of his short stories presented in English on one side of the page and on French in the other. And um, this is actually really cute because my girlfriend read this in English when she first moved to England to improve her English. And now I'm doing it the other way around. I'm reading it to improve my French. And uh, yeah, this was a gift from her. And I'm, you know, it's one I'm very proud to own. Um, because it meant a lot to me, you know. And also, I've read these stories before, but I do still love them. And the cask of a Monta um, and the cask of a Montalado. See, I can say it in French, but not in English for some reason. Uh, was fantastic. Probably my favourite of the three. Although the, the fall of the House of Usher, 
that one was an interesting one too just because of the way that Poe's writing is you know uh, it's just very atmospheric and also it was interesting because the translation of it into French is newer so the French was easier to read than the English at least for me um, so that was yeah, a strange experience I gave it a uh, 4 out of 5 then we have A Room of One's Own by Virginia Woolf and this is non-fiction the premise here a woman must have a money a woman must have money and a room of her own if she is to write which I kind of disagree with I think a woman must have a laptop and an internet connection if she is to write but obviously this was written in like 1910 and certainly it was way more applicable then. It is still very applicable, especially when you look at how male dominated, say, publishing houses are. I do think the indie landscape is doing a lot better. Um, you know, I see people talking about like there's a lack of women in horror and stuff. And then I see people doing like women in horror tags and like, I mean, I could reel off probably a half a dozen female horror writers off the top of my head. All indies, of course. Like, I can't. Can't think of any mainstream ones, which is probably the problem, you know? Um, but yeah, so she's talking in here, like, about a lack of women poets, and I'm there, like, Kate Tempest. Like, she's probably the biggest, or, like, you know, young poet anyway, my generation's poet. Um, but she's certainly, like, the performance poet laureate, I guess. Um, but then I look at things like Battle Rap, for example, which is super male-dominated, and I watched a battle rap recently between two women, and... They were still both putting each other down with the same stuff menus, like calling each other sluts and stuff. And I'm like, I don't feel comfortable watching this, you know? Uh, to be fair, what I would say is that they, the, the two of them are like friends, and you get that in battle rap quite often. The two rappers actually know each other and their pals and stuff. So one of them choked and forgot her lines, and then the other one was like, come on, you, you know this one. And, um, you know, she came back and put in a good performance. But it's still a shame that that's what they rap about, you know, when I just feel like, they could have could have done something special there but yeah uh, I still think that this is very much worth reading and I actually think although I think times have changed today and we've definitely taken huge steps in the right direction we still have a long way to go and reading this now just makes me wonder like whether the fact that we've gone from where we were in 1920 to where we are in 2020 part of that is because of this book you know you, so you can't fault the book for being maybe not as updated in that sense because of the change that's happened because of it you know like, this points out the, the failures in society. Oh, I'm just getting ranty now. Four out of five, it was good. Yeah, probably will reread that one at some point. All right, just one more book for you today, and that is The Outsider by Stephen King. This was sent to me by Charlie Heathcote, so thank you, Charlie, for sending this my way. I guess this is like a crime novel, but with elements of the supernatural thrown in. It's kind of the unofficial, or maybe official, book four in the uh, uh, Bill Hodges se uh, series. I was going to say trilogy, but I guess it's not a trilogy if this is still included in it. Uh, basically, uh, a child is brutally murdered and there are uh, like eyewitnesses and DNA proving that somebody was there, but you can also prove that he wasn't there. And um, yeah, we kind of go from there. The problem that I had is that if you've read enough King by this point, you can kind of predict where it's going with it, you know? So you're kind of watching this investigation happen for this crime and you're just like, but I know it's going to be something supernatural, like, uh, you know, you can, you, so it's, it's almost like, it's almost anticlimactic watching them in investigate it like a normal crime when you know that it isn't. And then about two thirds of the way through, Holly Gibney makes an appearance, um, which I don't know, it just, yeah, it just felt a bit forced to me to try and tie it back to the Bill Hodges books as well, because if she hadn't have came into it, this would have just been a standalone. So I'm, I'm just like, why not just do it as a standalone, I guess. Um, yeah, it was just, it was alright, I suppose. Not my favourite. I gave it a 3.5 out of 5. I think it would have been pretty good if, if this had been written by like a first time author or something. They would have done a really good job, but because this is King, you know, I just expect a lot more from it. But I am glad I read it, and uh, yeah, one more closer to having finished all of his stuff. So there we have it, I've reached the end of the year, so those uh, were the books I read in December. As always, thanks a lot for watching, don't forget to hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Let me know in the comments if you've read any of these books. Hit that subscribe button for more and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot, bye bye.